How's everyone doing? Are you guys alive? Are you awake? Yeah? yeah. All right. Um, I hope your brains aren't melting too much from all of this amazing intellectual rigor. Um, join me in welcoming my panel. We have Monique Simard from Sodec. You can applaud, yes. Uh, <laughs> Nancy McGovern from MIT Library. Chance Kokenauer, which I just learned how to say that, um, from Google Cultural Institute. And Janine Steele from ONF. So we're, we have the distinct pleasure of talking about policy today, addressing, I think, what has been kind of the elephant in the room all day. Um, so to start, uh, we're going to hear from the panelists to kind of set the stage, uh, introduce a bit of their work, and also some of the, the ideas and projects and concepts that we'll be talking about in the panel. Um, Nancy will go first. Um, Nancy is one of the digital preservation pioneers um, in the field, according to her Wikipedia page. I was stalking them all <laughs> online. Um, so. That was a fascinating day, learning that I had a wiki page. I was like, wow! Um, <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for having this today and for all of your brilliant presentations and uh, making it possible for me to not spend too much time on my slides, because so much of what we need to talk about has been said. Um, and to, to actually be invited to talk about policy, normally I have to say, no, really, we should talk about policy. <laughs> so this is great. Um, this morning got me thinking, I rewrote my slides totally. I, a bunch of us were up there kind of like, oh, geez, this is so exciting, let's do it. Um, I'm normally like the lone voice on preservation, so wow to have, like, my happy place is archives plus history plus technology, and mm, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I do have uh, degrees in history. At bring, you know, these things intersect. Um, digital preservation community, I've been working on building this community for more than 20 years. Uh, last year, I passed 30 years of digital preservation practice, uh, digital content management. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And um, the interesting thing is when I started at National Archives in the U.S., uh, I would say that, I make sure, in the U.S., um, the, it was 50, they had, you know, they just passed 50 years. So I was a newcomer. I was like, wow, you, you, you're just late to the game because they've been doing it for 20 years already. Um, just a couple things because I, I really want to make sure we go through the, um, ongoing impact to, uh, in the technological change. That was my PhD. It was like, it were really fun to work on. But bottom line there, I'm a hopeful realist. I don't, and, and it'll, this will be a theme, I don't really believe in either ors, I believe in and. And so hopeful realist is perfect for digital preservation and so forth, we'll see. Um, I am an archivist who does digital preservation in a library. MIT Libraries is my organization. Um, it is not my profession. Um, so I'm not a librarian. And that's important, but maybe not so much today. I want to invite you to this. We heard this morning about some of our great activists, uh, Burgess Jewell and uh, Jarrett Drake. They're some of the organizers for this. It's the first time uh, SAA has turned Society of American Archivists. I'm the president this year. I end in July. Um, we're very excited. We have never turned over the whole of Saturday to anything. Um, and it's going to be a great day. And it's Portland, the last Portland, Oregon. Um, we have a place in Maine, so it's the other Portland. Um, and, we, and it's that, um, the, the uh, last Saturday in July. Who doesn't want to come there? It's going to be a great time, and we're going to try to uh, share virtually as much as we can if you can't make it. The other invitation is MIT and Harvard are organizing the International Preservation, Digital Preservation Conference in 2018. Uh, please come. Uh, we're going to be talking about all these things. And why you and all, I was thinking, oh my god, they all have to come. Um, where art and science meet, right there. They're going to meet in Cambridge, so you know. Um, and so, um, this is another thing that we launched at, soon after I got to the libraries. I've been there for five years. I'm a Massachusetts native, so it's home. And, and MIT, I was like, I grew up going like, wow, MIT. There I am. It's awesome. So, Digital Sustainability Lab, 
we seek solutions. We continually seek solutions for the future. Uh, this guy, Jeff Rothenberg, is the, the godfather of emulation for digital preservation community. He introduced it in a science article in the early 90s. And this is the important part. He said we need a continual cycle of research and development and research and development. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we've been talking about. Just about every couple years for the last 30, somebody has said, this is the most exciting time to be in digital preservation. We used to call it something different, but still. Um, and then, you know, what that means is it's just plain exciting to do digital preservation. <laughs> it's always going to be exciting. It'll always lead us to the future. And if we work it right, the, the content will come with us. Um, this is the open dome. Those of you, um, MIT's iconic dome. This is um, the future of the libraries. Um, this is what we're talking about. Everything we've been talking about, you can find in the report. And that, this is why we love her. We do great things and we have fun doing them. What is not to like about that? <laughs> She's incredible. Um, these are two um, definitions that I really thought we would need today, and we really don't. These are ones that have come out through the day. Um, people have been talking about so much of it. But to me, it's the readability and usefulness. And to figure that out is a case-by-case -case thing. Um, I, don't, I don't mean like one case at a time. I mean categories. How do we find right-sized strategies for the content we care about, the content that we've been hearing about today? And this part shows you how policies fit in the context of digital preservation. They capture decisions. OK, this one I had, I really, I'm not going to dive in. Um, we're going to go up. Um, <laughs> but this is OK. This is my response to, for years, hearing how, you know, what's your IT stack like? Because people want to treat digital preservation like a technology-only solution. Um, we don't want a technology pogo stick. We want a three-legged stool that includes technology. And so this is an IT stack that plugs into the, the digital asset management stack. But it means you can say, that damn stack. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where governance is policies. And it goes down and it goes up. And we'll see a little bit more of that. If you build a strong damn stack, you can build really great discovery and use layers that change with time. And, and build on whatever sustainable and compliant technology you have on the bottom. It's a base, and that's what we're working on. So these are the things I do every day. Other, one more thing, over time is digital preservation, and real time is uh, stewardship. It's digital archives. It's the thing, and so, and it turns out my wife is a digital archivist, also at MIT, the first one there. We partner in a lot of ways, but um, <laughs> she is, so over time, real time. That's what we're talking about. Again, not going to go deep on this, but policy, if you Google policy, you're likely to get a single statement. If this happens, then do that, or a 40-page document. So <laughs> this acknowledges that you have to parse it out. At the high level, it's the intention of the organization, in this case, to do digital preservation. Below that, there are lower-level policies, things like what's your preservation storage policy. Below that are if you have video, don't even try to get as many copies as you need. It's too big. Um, so, but how, many, how do we go about that, if then? And then the computer can say, now I can encode this, now I can respond. These have to work together. And these are just some examples of, OK, everybody loves examples, right? So at the top level, it's what content, what is this content, and why is it significant? What will we do about it being significant? All of these are decisions. And if you change policy development into decision making for action, you'll have a lot more company. People get sad when you say policy development. They get very excited when you say decision making for action. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Then you say below the high level of like, we have our overall uh, you know, commitment. And then below that, it's what characteristics and features are, are important to, just, to preserve and why. And we heard such great. Um, such great kinds of examples. The high-rise um, uh, documentation. Normally, I have to convince people to do documentation. This is a, an, an amazing community. I'm, I'm definitely staying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then below that, what specific actions do we need to take now? And then what can the computers? We can't fully automate. I don't think we should want to um, automate humans out of the picture. We want to partner humans and technology over time. And you know, we live at MIT, quantum computing. What are we going to do? It's going to come along. We're going to, in 100 years, we're talking about a different thing. 
Uh, this is what I came up with today because I, I, I don't know, I just generate diagrams. It's just the thing that happens. <laughs> um, so, but this is what I, and it kind of leads, I hope, into tomorrow, which is uh, what would a sustainability framework look like? What could it look like? And it parses out because if a problem is too big, like digital preservation, and you parse it out and then reconstruct it into a model that works, it's the thing, that's the process, you, that's the way to go. It's much more sustainable, and in the process, you build awareness. So performance framing, those are the great high-rise examples of what were we doing and why were we doing it? Design, documentation, um, iterations. So part of it is to know, is this one thing, or is it an ongoing thing? Are there moments of milestones you want to capture? In my world, that's often records management. We have skills to kind of play into this. And then the components, um, objects, files, metadata, relationships between them, and then the originals, because you want that, but also the converted versions that work now. So how does that look? And imagine arrows going all over the place. And then below that, um, structured definitions of enabling technologies. Um, we don't have to always say, this is HTML. OK, I'm moving on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Your enthusiasm is so infectious. Well, this time yeah. you're right too, right? No, it's great. Um, next, we'll hear from Janine. Oh, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to follow that and then be buttressed <laughs> by Monique Samard. I'd be lucky if you remember that I'm that chick from the NFB. Um, I'm Janine Steele. Uh, I'm here as the Director of Operations and Production for the National Film Board of Canada. I think that probably... Everybody, that's the one. Uh, everybody is familiar with what the NFB is in this room, but for all of our guests uh, that are live streaming us, the NFB is a public producer and distributor of socially relevant audiovisual content for Canadians and from Canadian points of view. We've been uh, around for almost 80 years. There's 13,000 works in our collection, um, nearly 100 of which uh, are in the relatively new genre of interactive and interactive documentary uh, made over roughly the last 10 years. So what does preservation mean at the NFB? Um, first of all, we're not an archive or a library. Um, so as uh, many have said before, the and Jason uh, so eloquently, and I'm stealing it, I put it into my notes, access is the driver for our preservation policies. So how do we keep our content um, as accessible as possible for as long as possible? That's really uh, what's driving us both as a producer and a distributor. Um, I come from working within the digital studios, and now I'm also responsible for all of our digital platforms, including nfb.ca, our app stores, uh, our work on our app stores, as well as our VR stores. Um, so I need to find a balance between these two hats, production and access. So I produce for today, or my my uh, colleagues produce for today. So my primary concern with that hat remains how people consume our work now. All of our work is audience-led design, inspired by use habits and norms, uh, so we cannot be constrained by older preservation-focused standards in terms of what we produce. We want to try and give as much freedom to our artists as possible to use whatever technology supports their work. Um, and when Interactive was formed, we created websites. Uh, but now, we create websites, mobile and VR apps, games, installations, and content for social media. It's a lot more options and a lot more technology to deal with. Mo money, mo problems. Um, which is a good problem to have, uh, but definitely a challenge. So with my other hat, uh, I need to preserve for tomorrow. As an institution, we have to think about how we can extend the life of our work beyond the technologies they were created in, and what happens to our work when that technology dies. And as we've seen today, several of our technologies have died, and I'm dealing with those emails. Um, some things you can't predict. When we created projects in Flash, uh, we never foresaw the iPhone in the App Store. And that was the beginning of the death of Flash. We didn't realize um, how much having computing power in your pocket would change how we interact with things. So we have 10 projects in the canon that have been talked about today, um, and they may end up only in history books and not able to be consumed. So some of our guiding principles at the NFB as we think about this, and I think um, this echoes a lot of what we've heard today, so hopefully this acts as points of clarity and not simply points of redundancy. Um, but we focus on cataloging our data, conserving the assets, um, and capturing the experience. So we have pretty clear paths for how to handle data and assets. But the more complex question, as we've heard over and over again today, is how do you preserve the experience? What is that experience? And what is it about it that we want to preserve? So if it was only a moment in time, do we need to gracefully let go, as Brent suggested us to us today? Uh, lastly, um, not just preserving the experience, but extending the experience. 
So um, with Casper and Erwin's help, as well as collaboration with Google and the folks at the Chrome VR team, um, we piloted the adaption of one of our works from Flash to WebVR. That's Bear 71. You can see it at bear71vr.nfb.ca. Um, and this is but one example of what we can do. Uh, it was a very exciting experience. Um, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, but the ability to bring this to a new technology, to a new audience, and continue uh, the story of Bear was, uh, was exciting and something that is open, uh, open standards and uh, sort of a new frontier within technology. So what we can do, hopefully re rebuild, port, and future-proof as best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. My presentation. Yes. So I'm Chance Kokenauer from Google Arts and Culture. I'm here to tell you about an amazing platform that maybe if you're, you don't know about it, you will after this short presentation. So here's a short video to give you some idea about it. Um, but before, actually, before I show the video, let me just say that Google Arts and Culture was launched in 2011 with uh, basically our aims are in line with Google's broader mission to organize and make the world's information more accessible. So in this case, uh, arts and culture, of course. Our platform allows our partners to showcase their treasures from the world to a global audience. Inspiration is spread around the globe across space and time, in the places we love and with the people of our past. Art has changed the way we see the world and the way we see each other. We started with simple tools for food and fire and then carved statues of myths and heroes. And we built monuments to last forever. There is so much to see, learn, and experience. With the Google Arts and Culture app, you can immerse yourself in 360 degree views using Google Cardboard. Or zoom in to reveal the secrets of a masterpiece. Discover inspirational moments, iconic people, and artistic wonders. Search by time or even color. Save your favorites and share them with the world. Explore more with Google Arts and Culture. Download the app and get inspired every day. Where will you start? So Google Arts and Culture we, uh, at Google Arts and Culture, we are partnering with over 1,200 institutions from around the world in 70 plus countries with more than uh, 6 million cultural objects in our database. Uh, and, but most importantly, it's being organized by the partners themselves. And as you see here, more than uh, 2,200 online exhibitions that are curated by them. Important to point out, None of this content is owned by us, it's theirs. They have total control over it, and we actually help them even continue to digitize uh, works of art that they may not have access to the technology uh, that's necessary. For example, an art camera, which is a gigapixel camera, or archival scanner. These stories, of course, are organized and they're accessible through uh, your desktop computer, tablets, and your iOS or Android device. But we're also working not just by cataloging and sharing these stories online and, pro and providing a platform to par our partners to do that, but we're also working with artists and engineers who are experimenting at the crossroads where art meets machine learning too. And you can learn more about this in a TED talk that my uh, director, Amit Sood, uh, gave. You can find that online. But here's an interesting one, the X degrees of separation experiment, which you can access online, which finds the visual similarities between two works of art in our uh, database uh, by visual similarity alone, not the metadata itself, which makes a very fun way to uh, learn about new art in a new way. Or, for example, uh, 
for example, what happens when you use machine learning to map thousands of artworks into an, integra uh, an interactive 3D landscape uh, based on visual similarity as well. Which basically brings us to a new focus since I came on board about uh, less than six months ago, is to go into focusing on the preservation aspect, the preservation strategy for Google Arts and Culture as it continues to grow and grow. Uh, we've helped showcase interactive models from the site of Palmyra, for example, uh, at a, at a uh, short exhibition at the Grand Palais with the Louvre, uh, using Google Tango devices and uh, actually showcasing 3D models of destroyed heritage and hypothesized reconstructions of what they looked like before they were destroyed. Uh, as well as what I mentioned before, our art camera, which we do f with any of our partners for free. We provide that service. Uh, recently, we just released, because the uh, Ghent altarpiece, one of the most stolen artworks in history, was recently restored, and we offered and used our uh, gigapixel camera to, to basically digitize it in a way that was never uh, done before and allowing anyone anywhere to access it online and learn those stories. So, thank you very much. All right, and last but certainly not least, well, Dominique. <laughs> um, just to say, I used to be a independent documentary producer, and then I went on to work at the ONF NFB as director general of the French program when we opened the interactive studios. And for the last three years, I'm now president of SODEC. SODEC is a public funding agency for film, television, music, book publishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I really want to talk, I, I don't want to talk, it's like preaching to converted here. <laughs> like everybody agrees that we have to do something about it, that we think that Yes, there is you know, digital art, there are, there, it is pure cultural products, and cultural products need to be preserved in any way. So I don't want to go into the details of what everybody talks so eloquently today about technology and the possibilities, but there's an elephant in the room, <laughs> which is resources, money, and people, and that um, it's essential to have that to do what we've been talking this morning. Um, we're in Canada here, so we do have some kind of public programs and public money and public rules. <laughs> we still have. <laughs> They're kind of challenged, though, in recent weeks um, by our southern friend. Uh, what I'm meaning is that... <laughs> Well, it's true, you know, he wants to reopen NAFTA. NAFTA has a cultural excep exception clause. By the way, I think it's important today, I'll take just 15 seconds. Um, who knows about here La Clause d'Exception Culturelle, the cultural exception clause in NAFTA? Who knows? Raise your hands, the one that know about it. Oh, this is... So when it was negotiated about 25 years ago, Canada, Canada insisted that cultural products would be excluded from the trade deal. Of course, it was a hard negotiation. Fortunately, Mexico came in, and both of us ganged up against the stance that got that. So which means that we cannot be uh, accused of un unloy, comment on dit, uh, commerce déloyal, or whatever, you know, um, uh, unfair trading, because we have public programs here to support music, film, whatever, name it, we have a public program. <laughs> you know, by the way, why the lumber industry is in such, in such a mess with the United States? Because here it's public land. So that is considered by the United States as being unfair trade. So imagine for culture that if this exception, this cause of exception is, you know, evacuated, we're going to really have a hard time because here, we don't have a big market, not enough to sustain, you know, like commercially, uh, our production, our distribution, and whatever of, of culture. So I just, this is my little editorial of the day. Um, and it's really serious, really, really serious. Yes, please applaud, yes. It is really, really, really serious, you know. 
chicken farmers are looking after their things, beef, uh, whatever, hoarders. But in culture, we have to you know, be, uh, you know, be very aware of this. So to come back to the purpose of the day is, of course, I'm converted. When I was used, working at the NFB, we had a committee, you know, what should we preserve? When does uh, something, you know, um, une oeuvre stops living? Uh, when do we, you know, take the plug out? Uh, what should we preserve? And so before coming to do this, this, this panel today, I just phoned up the NFB, so is there anything new since I left? <laughs> said, mm, no, there's not even a committee on anymore. So the, oh la la. So I tried going around and seeing that people are kind of stuck on this issue. And I think there, it's stuck, it's not the concept of it that really stops people, because eventually you'll get around to see what has to be preserved. You know, you do that very eloquently, by the way. And, uh, and a lot of people, I think that would get around it. It's that we don't have the means to do it. So if you don't have the means to do it, you know, there's nothing pushing you to do it. Because even if you did find a, a framework, you won't get the money to do it. Or the people, and you need, you know, there has to be people, and people needs money. So I think that at this point in time, we have to go and preach to the non-converted. Uh, no, it's, this is really serious. Mm -hmm. Because as William said very well this morning, you know, he just talked about television. Well, television when, you know, 50, 60 years ago now, we go, yeah, it was live tape. So you just tape again and throw away whatever. Uh, even when it was on film, because at the beginning, television was on film. No, it wasn't on tape, it was film. They just use the film again and use it. it because in their minds, it wasn't important to preserve anything. You know, like, we'll throw the newspaper, tomorrow's a new one. That they realized later on that was a huge mistake. So I think that now we have to realize and go to the decision making makers and say, this is a huge mistake. Because this is part of not only our cultural production, and cultural production is the identification of a society, of the relationships in a society. And that is, that is important, uh, historically, sociologiquement, say it, it's important. And that we have to have a public policy about it. When you write a book here, you have the obligation to go and, you know, give it to the National Library. If not, your book doesn't exist officially. And we introduced a few years ago, and Jean Gagnon, are you, oh yeah, I used to be head of the board of La Cinémathèque for many years. I suffered a lot because <laughs> there was no money. <laughs> and was there when they introduced this new law, the you know, legal deposit. And really, really fought for it because before that, there was no legal obligation. So there was no assurance that, you know, uh, film or television would be uh, uh, anywhere preserved or conserved. So finally, there's an obligation. If you get public money to produce your work, you have to go and give a copy. Only if you have public money. And public money, by the way, here can be investment, grants, or tax credits. And by the way, the uh, gaming industry in Quebec gets a 37.5% uh, tax credit on every, every job. That's a, you know, it's, it's not because we're smart, we have so many gaming <laughs> businesses in Quebec, is that we have this such great system. And, and so the Ubisoft, I don't know if our friend of Ubisoft is still here. Um, it is here, of course, because of that, that's okay. Um, but still, it's public money. A tax credit is public money. So that everybody that has this public support for producing something has the obligation of going and giving a copy. So we'll, we can define that, in, and of course, interactive work. If interactivity is the essence of the work, of course part of it has to be in it, of the experience. How to frame it will depend on the work. It will depend on the experience. It will depend on many things. But still, it's, I think, well, France, has always been a country where they, they give importance to, to memory and to archiving. So not going anywhere here, so I took my phone and phoned in Paris. So what are you doing? Well, there's still 
it's in the law, but I don't really know how to do it, but they have, well, they have resources. Well, up to now they have resources, but they'll find a way. So uh, what I'm pleading for now, and I did phone a deputy minister about this a few months ago. Oof. She almost hung up on me. <laughs> um, not telling me you need money to conserve it. She says, yes, it's important. Even though it's not my direct responsibility, I invest in, in production and, and distribution, but I, I feel that it's so important at this point in time and that um, this conference is extraordinary and I, I really salute you know, my friends at MIT, my friends at the Fee Center for doing this and all the other ones that have you know, sponsored it and participated. But it's, it's kind of late now because things, things are moving so fast. You know, technology in television was the same for many years. It didn't change that much, you know. Uh, technology in film didn't change that fast either. You know, 10, 20 years, 30 years. But we're in another world right now, and things are changing at a space that is, you know, un unknown in history. So we have to be fast on conservation also. And we have to have flexibility to the policies we will establish. Because you know, when you establish policy, it's complicated. And once it's voted, if you want to change it, it's long, et cetera. Legislation and reglementation. So, so I would say this is now time that we know that we have to do it. We know the technology, you know, of course, you know, purists will always argue, but that's, that's okay. Uh, but there has decisions to be made, but more and more important, there has to be strong lobbying to make it something that is across the board. And it's not a pick and choose. If we believe that is, it is a big part of our cultural production in the widest sense that you can give it to that expression, it has to be there and preserved and accessible. Merci beaucoup. So I'm going to put my questions aside for a moment and kind of roll with this theme because I think it's really important. And you know, we could spend the next 30 minutes talking about the complexities of crafting, you know, digital preservation policies that work for different kinds of variable media and all of that. But I think the bigger issue is how does this become a priority for uh, governments, for cultural institutions? Um, it's, in it's interesting that a lot of the examples that we've heard from today are coming uh, from institutions or, or private organizations, right? So it's, it's not something that uh, is necessarily being spearheaded by uh, public institutions, um, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. And if B is totally public, yes, hundred percent. But but they're preserving their own work, yeah, right? That's true. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, maybe I want to turn this over to Nancy and Chance, um, who are operating, uh, you know, in in this space where you're collaborating with cultural institutions, with academia, with uh, governmental uh, institutions, and um, trying to craft. Uh, policies, but also to get stakeholders to agree. Um, so I, I'm curious to know if there's any um, strategies or best practices or um, things that you found, any, any examples that you can share with us um, that might be useful going into tomorrow's policy round table, especially. It sometimes sounds like I'm not answering questions, but I really am. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So one of the things that has surprised, so the archival community has been at this a long time. Um, and yet, we've been, apparently, we just found out recently that we've been hiding our light under a bushel. We've been working really, really hard and not um, connecting. You know, How do you get the imperative to do these things? People have to know that you're doing it. Suffering in silence, it turns out, doesn't get actually a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, <laughs> And so what I'm doing on Monday and Tuesday is the, the Association of Research Libraries is, is holding a two-day meeting to, to called Libraries Plus. I, get, I, I think we're the plus. Um, and it's about the data rescue mission. So yeah, you know, I, I, there's one word that's out of my vocabulary 
for a long time, like months now, Trump. Um, but with some of the changes that have um, been coming, the data rescue things were like, oh my gosh, we have to go and save all this federally created data. I spent 10 years appraising, preserving. I know where it lives. I can't. But you know what? Not everybody knows where it lives, it turns out. Our uh, librarians would, um, are awesome at access strategies, at discovery. One of the things is that the technology not only helps us do uh, get new content, it also helps us work together and to do things better together. So um, I have another diagram that has to do with the strengths of the various domains that have to be around the table. And it's no longer about who leads the table, it's about how do we meet in the middle. And some of this is about the cumulative voice of all of these domains, IT and, and software development and, and funders themselves and that, you know, coming and, and we used to care a lot about how many, you know, more stuff or, uh, you know, just all these measures that are really meaningless if you're not able to work together to do things and to keep going. So I think part of it is to get over our, you know, little hair splitting. We have five technical subcommittees in SAA on metadata and, I'm, and I keep trying to tell people, the outside world doesn't know we exist, and we, we can't have five of you debating about this field in a database. Um, it can't happen. We have to have more kind of things. So um, we need to collaborate. We need to have a, um, a voice. We need to use the technologies um, to kind of get the voice out there. We need to put our pride aside and, and make it about saving stuff and making real, the storytelling, storytelling for preservation. And how do we kind of do that? Um, and, and, you know, have bake sales if we need to. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead. Storytelling for preservation is specifically where Google Arts and Culture, that's what we do. <laughs> you know, we're, we're basically providing a platform for a large museum, public, private, from anywhere to, uh, to display or to show and to share their stories online in a unique way. One of the ways, and, and, and answering the question, is that it is very complicated because it depends on what type of institution, uh, what strategies, what importance, uh, what are their um, plans for how a collaboration with Google Arts and Culture would work. Or, for example, if a small museum in X country or state doesn't even have the funding available to create a website, to have a webmaster for um, to actually use a gigapixel type camera to, uh, to digitize or to document their art, that's what we're offering for them for free. So our focus primarily has been in the game of figuring out what documentation strategies were kind of missing and what ways that we could bring our tech side to it. And in that, in the development of that has been the preservation layer always there in the way that we're not only we're preserving those those works but we also the institutions themselves are uploading them to our, our uh, it's their content but they're uploading it to our site where they enter their metadata information and that way it's actually searchable in very interesting ways we can bring themes together from across the spectrum of cultural institutions in unique ways do you see it at all as your um, potential role as you know Google, this mega corporation, um, in in trying to drive conversation or get stakeholders to the table to have these conversations? I mean, it seems like given the position of the company, you guys would have considerable influence. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you guys? really take into account at all? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, we've, we're spending so much uh, time and effort actually to get the, the buy-in for, for important stakeholders from an executive level of museums down to the curators who want to share their stories, you know, that are, that are uh, struggling either with resources, time, staffing, etc. And um, it is a continuous challenge that, and it changes from country to country. We're even bringing institutions together across from one side of the world to the other that have works of art that are from the same artist, that are in their own collections, and trying to convince them to let's, let's bring all of those works together digitally, virtually online, so that anyone could see them all online, which you wouldn't be able to see in a physical place. So that is, those are, that's like one example where it's uh, quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. And to kind of bring it, Nit, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be negative towards what Google does. It's OK. But Google cannot be a substitute to public policies no, in the not. countries. And I think that's, a, that's yeah, it's yeah. an addition. Yeah, it's absolutely. an addition. Yeah. 
Um, because right now, sometimes people say, oh, Google will be doing it or somebody else will mm -hmm. be doing it. It has to be integrated into mm -hmm. public national policies. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know that there is an international convention on, on a cultural diversity, UNESCO. Mm -hmm. Only three countries didn't sign it, as you probably know, the United States, China, and Israel. We're probably going to try to retract that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you, they did in December vote new rules for digital cultural products. Um, and I, I'm referring to what our Kenyan friend this morning said. Mm -hmm. We have to take that into account also. And um, these new, because when the first one was adopted, you know, it was not really, we were not much into digital production. Now we are. So they did adopt a set of new rules in December of 2016 about the diversity of different cultural expressions also in the digital world. So I think this whole group should also be aware of that, that it's, of course, it doesn't have the strength of implementation as you know national laws would have, but still can be a basis on which different national governments can you know, argue that they should be doing this and that, et cetera. So. No, absolutely. And I mean, I'm really glad that you brought up Jeb Chumba and her presentation because I think this question of who's at the table, who gets to decide, whose cultural heritage is preserved and represented um, is a really important one, especially, you know, when we talk about resources, like, you know, if you're only uh, focused on uh, using your resources to preserve the cultural heritage of your country, um, then, you know, does Kenya have, have a chance? I don't know. Um, At least to recognize that they're doing good stuff right. in Kenya. No, 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 absolutely, right? But um, I think it's, it's uh, the imbalance um, is important to recognize as well. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of get a snapshot of what this looks like within an organization like the NFB um, that also, I'm guessing, has you know good resources, but um, competing uh, departments. And you know, you're like, do we fund this great creator, or do we use this funding to preserve our existing collection? Um, and so these kind of competing interests and how they play out within an institution, where you have to make really hard decisions about mm -hmm. how to spend the resources that you have, um, and how does that get prioritized? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm looking for partners, if anybody wants to help us preserve our collection. Um, but yes, yeah, so as I said, it's sort of a very fine um, sort of balancing act that we do in order to uh, create new work, continue to push and innovate. Thank you, Monique, for creating that space for us, along with some of your friends. Um, so how do we find that, that balance between wanting to make sure this remains accessible um, for audiences? Um, and I think it's, it's, it is an ongoing conversation. I think that um, it's something that really this conference happening is actually kind of creating a lightning rod to restart that conversation at the NFB, which is great. Um, and as I say, we've, we've already started the process of cataloging the data and capturing assets. Um, and where we still need to uh, find the route is how do we capture that experience? I think there's a lot of great examples that have been presented today. Um, but uh, we need to we, we need to find those dollars, and, and honestly, I think we need to partner. So for me, it's about um, reaching out to the right people that might have larger pockets than we do. Um, and you know, we're inherently selfish creatures. So to talk to them about what's in it for them, why should they care? Um, and show and help show them the way through storytelling, through um, at, through all the means at our disposal to really say, Okay, this is something I'm going to care about too. If someone, if they have to answer to their constituents or answer to their public about why didn't you save that, why haven't you helped us here, then we can um, hopefully keep moving that forward and, and find some bigger pockets of money. Um, we're doing what we can with the money that we have, and uh, and we'll keep doing that. But uh, I think we all have to kind of collectively work towards it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on. Um, some of the uh, open standards kind of community created solutions that some of which we heard about today, like the Internet Archive, 
uh, the web recorder project, which really put these tools in the hands of a vast audience online um, to try and decide what gets preserved and, and to uh, you know kind of remove some of the um, gatekeeping um, versus more kind of custom solutions that um, institutions with resources might have themselves. Um, Nancy, Chance, Janine, have you experimented with, I'm sure you have, <laughs> what are your opinions? <laughs> Actually, one of my favorite open source providers is in Canada, Artifactual. Um, they're just awesome. And it's open standards, open formats, open, you know. Um, so from a digital preservation perspective, we've always really, uh, it's software dependency is such a big problem. That's so it's been, it's, it's from, from, from all ways um, that you get to see it, that you, um, that they don't have secret sauce you can't see. That you that that all leads to like longer term um, preservation that that works, um, but it also means that open source works best in a time that's most transformative, um, because you can you can quickly get to development partnerships and things like that that can happen. There'll be a number that come out from from this meeting and from tomorrow, and those are really important. And um, when you and you can tell when you're getting into advanced stages of development because the the, the capitalist um, forces take over and you tend to get more um, vendor software and other things kind of coming out of that. So it's it's important to keep that open and, and open-ended. And um, I'm really comfortable with open-ended. It turns out not much of the world is really not. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't actually have a lot of resources in our community, but you know there are commercial entities who really are convinced that, that we do maybe hidden in our pockets, and it's just not the case. So, But there's a lot of room for um, op, um, opportunities for partnerships. The, the technologies, all of it is working together to um, get to this point. And it's only been within the last year or two that we've gotten to version one on some of our open source um, pieces of software for and support for digital archives and by relationship digital preservation. So these are just heady times. And, and open it opens all kinds of doors for the things that we need to do together. Yeah, it's definitely one of our guiding uh, sort of guiding principles are, is that we, if we're looking at what we, how we can archive things or how can we preserve things, looking at open standards, open source um, is the only way to go. I think that's, as I sort of mentioned earlier, uh, Flash is a really good example of something that couldn't change with the times. It's proprietary software. It got into a little fight with Google, or sorry, not Google, the other one, Apple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting distracted with chance off the side of my eye, sorry, with Apple. Um, and boom, Flash doesn't work anymore, and neither do half of our projects. Um, so it, when you deal with proprietary software, you have a lot of things outside of your control. Um, but as William so eloquently posted, uh, mentioned earlier, with open source and open uh, standards, those have a longevity to them that other people, a community, is contributing to. And so it's really the backbone of, of uh, our processes, for sure. Does Google publish any open source uh, preservation software? No. Uh, I'm not particularly no, sure. Not sure. I don't know. <laughs> Just I curious. Know. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that are open source yeah. that are created by Google. But specifically with preservation software, I'm actually not, um, mm -hmm. not aware. Maybe that's your next project. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious. Uh, it's come up a number of times today with different perspectives, this question of, should we be able to save everything? And <laughs> how do we decide what to save, right? Uh, Monique, you mentioned you know, the, the television film that was taped over again and again, and they didn't realize that it was important, you know, um, especially with the volume of content that we have coming online today. William's uh, chart from this morning, you know, the staggering um, hours and hours and hours of uh, content. How do we even prioritize? Um, so, so. <laughs> um, I, I was responsible for appraisal at US National Archives for Electronic Records for about a decade. And it, a problem that I personally have is that once I get to know digital content, I want to keep it because I love it. Um, but that there's so much um, that you can do in that. So there's a, there's a structure and a format. Is this thing significant? If not, stop now and, and move it on. Um, and significance, of course, that's a whole, that you could spend a whole day on significance. Um, is this thing preservable? Um, and that, the, the answer to that is so much more broad and possible than it used to be. Um, and can you make it available? And that's 
both technologically and rights-based. Um, from an archivist perspective, if you need a record 150 years from now, you need to have that record. Um, so, um, but also, on the other hand, um, it's been quite typical for two to five percent of records to be actually kept. So, of what's created, so we're quite used to making tough decisions because, you know, as cheap as storage is, we hear this a lot from people, you know, storage is cheap. Management is not. And long-term management accumulates. And so um, making the tough decisions is really important. I did it for 15 years. I like to take the ball once people have decided and now do digital preservation. What do we preserve? How do we preserve it? And, and, but there are loads of people who have lots of experience on figuring out some of these things. And we, we have to make those decisions. We can wait. We can sort of say, let's put everything somewhere and see. You can't tell what's seminal until you look back at it. Um, it, it's not, I mean, some things immediately, like, that's really important, but sometimes it's the looking back that allows you to recraft things and reframe things. Speaking of looking back and going to non-digital art for a moment, I'm actually a trained archaeologist, so let's think about this. For the majority of art and culture and the remains of our ancient past and the peoples of our past, we have remains of architecture uh, and monuments. We have manuscripts that are preserved, some of them that we can still read, thankfully. A lot of those were, the stories for, were actually the stories of the learned class or from the elite. What we know from archaeology is that what we learn about the majority of, of people, the non-elites, is actually from the trash, the rubbish bins, the rubbish areas where all of the, the, the rubbish was accumulating. That's where archaeologists love to find, and we find so much about the stories, and we can, we can actually learn about the people of the past. Mm -hmm. So just think about that when you're thinking about trying to answer the question, what should we save? I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting... <laughs> save all the trash. Yeah, save all the trash, <laughs> but I just want to bring that up as a point from what we learned from non-digital uh, non art mm -hmm. moving into digital. I mean, I think that's a really important point towards, you know, having a much more inclusive policy towards exactly. preservation, yep. right? Just like, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at one point it has choices to be made. Um, I come from the documentary world and started with in film, mm -hmm. not digital, film. So when you worked in film, you had to make choices during the time you were shooting. There's so much time, so you can't shoot more. So you have, the director has to make choices right there. When we came with digital, there was no limit to what you would shoot. So the editor would get 300 hours of shooting. Didn't make better films. Mm -hmm. The choices were done at a different time. And I think that it's, it's very, and, and I, what you, they're a good example, but I'm gonna give you the opposite example is that at one point choices have to be made. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it's not the fact that you can keep everything that makes it that you have to keep everything. But it's a very difficult process and I think it will apply to different genres and different types of works. And eventually we'll get um, a system to work it out or, or rules to get it out. But it's not because the technology permits you that you can accumulate. It's like the opposite of what we preach also in other areas. of. It's not because you can produce more that you should produce more or keep more. So if it applies in some areas, it also applies. And I think that, uh, again, our, our friend, which I don't remember her name from Kenya, what I find Chichumba. wonderful, okay. Chichumba, she said, we've never had so much information, and we've never been in a situation we, where we know so less. We don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to you know, give thought to that. Mm -hmm. um, can we just, sorry, can we just think about the ar archaeological? Because I, I not to disagree at all, but part of that is 2,000 years ago, if people had said, let's not let the future only find our trash heaps. <laughs> no, like, let's make sure that this thing is kept. And in the physical archives world, it's always in the attic or the basement. And, uh, you know, what survived was like Darwin. It wasn't, you know, so how can we be intentional about what we want to project into the future? Absolutely. I agree. And we should be taking our understanding how we learn about the past and, and basically following in that mm -hmm. direction to the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, 
Sorry, can I? Yeah. Just to keep going on the archaeology theme, I don't know why this is a, something we're so excited about, um, but when you were speaking, I, uh, it made me think of who should be at that table, who should be around the table. Um, just recently in, British, in BC, where I live, they discovered um, a dig site in a Heltzuk Nation, which is sort of in the middle of the province, um, and they found sites uh, and evidence of um, life that predated most of sort of our modern European history, something more than 10,000 thousand years, it predates the pyramids. Um, I'm sure I've got the dates wrong, but because I'm not great at that timeline. But um, the point being that there is a whole host of history and knowledge and culture and art that you know isn't in this room right now. I mean, if we look around and be honest, we're pretty white. Um, so thanks to Shambhuba, we have kept a little bit honest. Um, but that's something, as you know, in Canada, um, especially at the NFB, we really pride ourselves on, in terms of our relationship with Indigenous creators, that we you know we work with and tell stories with Indigenous uh, artists, um, not about them. Mm -hmm. But that con that has not necessarily translated to um, what their role is in terms of our distribution, in terms of our preservation. Um, and recently, the uh, federal government released what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Report, which is about sort of trying to rebuild trust and relationship with uh, Indigenous folks after sort of our appalling treatment throughout history. And um, one of um, the NFB's response to that is uh, putting, we've put together an Indigenous and advisory group. Part of that um, initiative is started today, which is our Wide Awake Tour, which um, with their recommendations is releasing um, uh, community screenings across the country over the summer um, and uh, 250 of our Indigenous works from the collection to bring them back to communities so that we can keep, uh, sort of renew that conversation and understand that, uh, that history is wider than sort of what we white settlers have decided is history. Um, um, and so just the opportunity for them to be at the table and actually influence how we do that has a huge change in what is decided to be preserved. And I think that's something to underscore what Monique said and what others have said today is so, so important. We have to have greater diversity and inclusion at the table to, to make that a reality. Absolutely. All right. I'm looking forward to this policy round table tomorrow and seeing what comes out of it. I hope you were taking notes on, on the great suggestions. <laughs> great. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank yes, you all so, yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you.